My name is John Bassett, and um, my background is that I was 20 years in the British Foreign Service, um, particularly working at an organisation called GCHQ, which is their um, Signals Intelligence and now Cyber Security Centre. And now run uh, my own uh, small uh, consultancy. Um, in this context, I'm also a founding member of the <coughs> International Advisory Panel for PS21. John, why are we talking so much about the notion of narrative today? I guess um, narrative, in the sense of storytelling, is actually something that goes deep into the uh, human conscience, uh, consciousness and personality. You can find narrative and storytelling <clears throat> deep in uh, most of our cultures. Um, and it's actually been used um, in terms of, of conflict for uh, really a very long time. We can look at Julius Caesar's commentaries on his Gallic Wars, um, a way there that he is manipulating and sometimes even constructing truths to tell the story he wanted his readers in Rome to listen to. I think it's become particularly relevant um, more recently for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is um, we've moved into the internet and more recently the social media world in which there is um, a huge amount of communication going on and how are people to make sense of what all these communications might mean. A narrative story is an important part of that. I guess it's also come to people's attention uh, because of the work of various thinkers, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, French philosopher Baudrillard, um, who famously, infamously, um, claimed that the, Gulf, the first Gulf War did not take place, and did a great amount of thinking on the importance of narrative, which I think informs us whether we realise it or not. What makes narratives so potent compared to other forms of communication? I think um, that point on the sense of story, how much people like story, whether it's the myths and legends, whether it's Jason and the Argonauts, whether it's uh, the Trojan War, um, right the way back, these are things that enliven and thrill us in a way that a scattergun series of facts in isolation have an impact in themselves, but they don't provide that bigger picture that we're always looking to. We're looking for a beginning and a middle and an end. We are looking, whether we like it or not, for heroes and villains. It's deep in the human uh, psychology to do that. So our brains are being hacked by narratives in a way. I think our brains are almost pre-programmed. It's, it's deep, whether it's genetic or whether it's behavioural, I don't know. But it's deep in us that um, that's what we want. We want a story. So narratives have been around for a long time, but what are the narratives that are currently destabilising our go governments and societies? OK, I mean, there are... Governments and establishments have traditionally generated their own stories and their own narratives, and it's quite integral into the democratic process. Um, over a period of many years, some centuries, um, that um, different parties will attempt to establish the primacy of their own narrative whether that's in the United, United Kingdom in the 19th century with Whigs and Tories, the 20th century with um, Labour and the Conservatives, and seeing now in the UK quite a, a varied set of narratives as politics here becomes more diverse. And that's sometimes confusing. There's a, a Scottish nationalist narrative. There's at least two different um, Labour Party narratives, one of Blairites, we might call them, and one of um, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, supporters. Um, there have been many different conservative narratives from uh, the Cameron narrative, which is now dominant, to the Eurosceptic narratives that had more traction some years ago. So we see them in politics all the time. We're also seeing, um, I think, in these last 25 years, 
the growth and the effective promulgation of non-establishment or anti-establishment narratives. And um, perhaps non-establishment initially is the word that this that the social media, the internet, allow the promulgation and development of fairly complex narratives with many different points in a way that that, that power was previously vested uh, with governments, large organisations, corporations, uh, political parties, major political parties and so on. In terms of um, destructive narratives, one man's destructive narrative is another man's liberation narrative. Um, there is, um, in terms of counter-narcotics, there's quite a powerful narrative, um, has been for a little while, which, in, which argues for um, the legalization of, of many drugs. Um, and that's a narrative that um, informally carries a great deal of weight, um, particularly amongst the UK political class. Yet it's not a, an establishment narrative in any sense. Um, we've also seen um, across the years since the end of the Cold War, the development by independent groups and non-state actors of their own powerful narratives, not just for their own supporters, um, but also more generally to influence wider opinion. Um, we think particularly at the moment of um, some of the narratives around IS. Uh, but not that many years ago, um, the AQ narrative, which is similar but not the same, also very powerful and we remember all those uh, videos released by Osama bin Laden to influence his supporters and perhaps to demor attempt to demoralise the West. Um, if you look back to the 1990s and some of the Balkans conflicts, they were very strong on narratives then, some of the warlords and nationalists, strong on narratives for their own people, not thinking so much, perhaps, about narratives to justify their position more widely or to demoralise their opponents. Mm. So perhaps those are some examples. So in some cases, we're led to believe that there is a clash of the civilizations when it's really a clash of the narratives. I think a lot of, um, I think that's exactly right. Um, the clash of civilizations is itself a narrative. Um, <clears throat> it's one way of interpreting history. Um, and some would, some would choose to adopt that approach because you believe there is a clash of civilizations. Others because it's convenient for whatever purpose, whether that's a political purpose, whether it's as uh, simple as um, intellectual laziness, it could be any of those factors. And these toxic narratives, why are they so hard to counter? The starting point is that we have not tried hard enough. Um, we can see uh, perhaps the beginning of modern, modern narrative and um, or contemporary narrative is to look at the Tet Offensive in Vietnam in 1968. Militarily, the Tet Offensive was an almost complete failure for the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. They were defeated in the end at almost every single point. They took very, very heavy casualties. So in a narrow military context, a disaster for them. But in terms of narrative, a huge victory, and one that the United States never recovered from in that conflict. Uh, Walter Cronkite's comments, seeing the US Embassy under attack in Saigon, I thought we were winning, supposed to be winning this war. At that point, um, the US government had lost the American people, and they never managed to recover them. Um, so I think there's been a sense that um, what does it matter if someone on the internet is saying something or other? No one will really take any notice of that. It's only been in the last five or ten years that we've realised that there is a much bigger game there. Then there was concern originally looking at these, um, what I'll call extremist, 
video messages and, DV and, and videos, um, that they could cause great distress to loved ones if it's a beheading uh, video. Um, and we would wish to remove it because of the concern uh, and, and um, upset that it would cause. And perhaps there's a concern that this is a form of media um, that might contain some kind of operational message, a cue for an attack or something like that. Um, but I think, so if you like, there were operational reasons that we used to study, that the governments used to study these communications. I think perhaps we didn't see the bigger picture, which is actually they are telling a story. And they are mm -hmm. taking facts and putting those facts, even sometimes quasi-facts, into a story. And it was a story that those people's supporters found plausible and strong and um, inspiring. And um, in another way, that domestic opinion in the West found distressing and um, caused a sense of frustration and hopelessness about the way the conflict was developing and being fought by the West. John, are we missing a strategy here in addressing those, uh, those toxic narratives? I think that quite often we do lack um, a strategy and we certainly lack um, aggressive ways of promoting our own narratives and um, I think the emphasis should be and I would put the emphasis on very much on promoting our own assertive narrative um, which would counter and hopefully overwhelm points in um, adversarial narratives. Um, I think that in the context of conflict which I'm, what I'm mainly talking about here a military or paramilitary conflict, then um, we have really seen strategic communications in quite a traditional sense that this is something where there will be a, an army press officer, whatever the particular context might be. But I think we have to look far more imaginatively at how we uh, conduct uh, and promote our own narrative. Um, and I'm interested in that, as I said earlier, political parties are, generally speaking, very effective at promoting those narratives, their own narratives. And um, party political leaders are very effective, extremely effective, if they're successful, in promoting their own narratives. But when they stop being just party political leaders and become ministers, um, everything seems to change. Um, and of course, you are working, and I used to be a civil servant, but uh, you're working with a group of people who historically have not warmed to active roles in, uh, in media. Uh, it's not in our, in our nature um, in the way that uh, it is for, for many other people. Um, and of course, there are very, very able government press officers they're not about uh, manipulating narratives. So I think we need to look, uh, in a context of a military campaign, we need to look quite imaginatively about the kind of people that we will be pulling in to help with that. And I do think of um, Alistair Campbell's Coalition Information Centre, set up after 9-11, and very much a, a transatlantic organisation which in my experience, was one of the few times that um, a government or governmental type organisation was really actively and effectively um, promoting a narrative. Although, of course, uh, whilst that worked very well in Afghanistan, it's pretty much discredited in the context of um, Iraq and the so-called weapons of mass destruction issues there. Mm. So I think we do, we need both strategy, but also new means of implementing that strategy. Talking about the Middle East specifically, are we also paying the price for cognitive dissonance between uh, our actions and, and the narratives we're promoting? I think that's right. I think that, um, 
I mentioned counter-narcotics some minutes ago, earlier on. Um, I think if we look at Afghanistan, um, we were insufficiently clear in our own minds that one of the main pillars of our um, program there, counter-narcotics and eliminating or vastly reducing um, opium production in Afghanistan, that that um, flew in the face of the logic of much of else of what we were trying to do, um, that counter-narcotics on one hand fine, um, but it's a user-led, it's market-led, it's not supplier-led. Mm. They grow poppy because people in this town and elsewhere in the West will buy that product, pay good money. And uh, if we block that, we undermine what we're trying to do in terms of economic development. We undermine um, what we're trying to do in terms of governance and political development. And we also undermine the security situation. So I think there was absolutely a dissonance there that we were trying to do some things that utterly undermined the really key parts of our programme without realising that this, this is not... This is something where the narrative goes very, very badly wrong. If we sit in Helmand telling people we've come to kill your poppies and stop you growing poppies, um, we, they aren't going to welcome us. So the way forward, what do we need to get better at to win the narrative? I think first is um, the sense that we need to recognise the strategic centrality of um, winning the narrative in any conflict in which we're involved. And in particular, any conflict which is essentially um, one where public support is contingent, uh, a war or a conflict that is not, say, a war of national survival, but an intervention, something where um, the continued uh, need for public support is important, then we need to be absolutely aware um, that that is our fundamental weakness. Um, and the TED offensive example is one that I will use again. We can win the battles, but if we lose the political narrative, we lose the war. So that recognition of the centrality of winning the narrative. And then I think flowing from that is the need to quite radically refresh the way we go about doing that. And as I say, I have some doubts that government has all the tools that it needs to do that effectively. I think it needs to look more widely, look at bringing in people who specialise in this sort of area. Um, so I think if you feel like it's a two-tier strategy. There's the strategic importance of this, this issue and there's the implementation. If we fail to get better at winning the narrative, what would be the cost? Well, it's only a, a personal opinion of mine, and in all of this is just my personal opinion. But I think the real risk that we run is that in any future military intervention, um, if we don't get better at winning the narrative, every one of our military interventions runs a, a high risk of ending in political failure. I think it's as simple as that. Well, thank you very much, John, for taking the time. Thank you.